Thank you. Thank you and hi everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you about what's become a huge passion of mine over the past six years. Um, I have, we're not a huge group. So if anyone does have questions or wants to add some something to the discussion, I'm happy to have you contribute and I'll do my best to watch the chat as I move along. I'm also joined today by Edwin Edwards, who is, oh, there he is, he just popped up. Um, he's going to join the discussion towards the end. He is one of the board members and very involved in the Friends of Cedarview, and he also has ancestors buried at the cemetery. So we'll get a quite different perspective from him in a little while. Um, so thank you again for having me. I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you today with lots of pictures. Uh, you might be wondering to yourself when you think about or hear my bio, what in the world this has to do, any of my social work, clinical social work background has to do with this cemetery. And I am gonna connect that in the end because what we're doing at the cemetery from a community partnership perspective is a very, very social work endeavor. Um, but let me first start by bringing up some information to you. And if for some reason you cannot see that, please um, yell or raise your hand or do something. Um, and if you can see it, I'm just going to move through. I'm gonna start with some history of the cemetery. If you haven't been there, uh, the cemetery is located at the back of the St. Leo the Great property behind St. Leo the Great and across from the Lincroft First Aid Squad off of Hurley's Lane, which is off of Newman Springs Road. Um, and its history starts at about 1850. Let's see if I can get this to move. So Cedar View Cemetery is actually actually been known by a bunch of different names. It's been known as the Lincroft Cemetery. It's been known as Hurley's Woods Burial Ground, the Reeves Burial Ground, and finally Cedar View Cemetery. And just a little plug for our group, there is a Facebook page, Friends of Cedar View. I hope you'll visit it and like it. Um, let's go into a little bit of history. So on November 14th, 1850, John Crawford, who was a wealthy farmer and former slave owner, sold a little over two acres of land for $60 to a group of 14 black men and in quotes to be used for a burial ground. This in and of itself is sort of interesting because you'll notice that the date is prior to the Civil War and one wonders why John Crawford might have done this, um, might have sold this land. Was it an effort to offer some protection from the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850? Uh, the land is very large. The, the plots themselves, there are 24 plots in the cemetery, by the way, and they're 30 by 99 feet each. And the first lots were designated for the people that are listed right there. And Alexander Frost purchased all the 12 remaining lots. So the first 12 lots were purchased by individuals, Silas, Joseph, Samuel, and so forth. And then Alexander Frost purchased the remaining 12 lots and then over time sold those lots. Now, let me show you what we're talking about. So this is the plot. These are the plots themselves. And if you're looking over here, number one, Silas Reeves, if you can see my cursor, this is actually Hurley's Lean. And in a minute, I'm gonna show you some maps that will help to kind of frame where I'm talking about. Um, but the lots are very large and it goes deep into the woods which probably is why it was neglected for quite a long time. I'm gonna show you some maps first, and then I'm gonna move into what might've been happening. I really love maps and I have to thank someone who's in the audience today, Joe Gravis, for providing me these maps several years ago. This is the map of this area of Lincroft in 1873. 
And you'll see my little oval here, just to orient you a little bit. This right here is what will become Hurley's Lane. At this point, it's not really Hurley's Lane. And here, if you're following my cursor, is Newman Springs Road. So what I like about maps, what I find interesting for this map in particular, is if you look at this oval down here, now again, this is 1873, you see um, on this oval, the Baptist Church, what's called the Baptist Church. And if you're ever driving down 520, Newman Springs Road, and you see a Chinese restaurant, that is actually right across from Acme, that is the property that we're looking at right here. And then we have Hurley's Lane. And then the cemetery itself, while not marked on the map, would be located just about here. Now, moving on to 1889. Now, Lincroft, of course, still farmland. But here's some interesting points again. Now, the orientation of this map is a little different. So here's Newman Springs Road. You're driving up Newman Springs right here. And again, here's Hurley's Lane. It's gotten a little farther than it was in 1873. And then here's what I call our cemetery. Here's the, what will be called the Cedar View Cemetery. It's right here, back in the woods. And you'll notice that while there's many, many landmarks noted on this map, there is nothing that denotes this as the cemetery. However, interestingly enough, across the street, right here, on again, Hurley's Lane, is a small familial burying ground, much, much smaller. And again, if you're ever driving up Hurley's Lane, you can see this very tiny burial ground from the Coles family, the familial plot. But again, it's marked and noted as a burying ground, Cedar View, still in 1889. Now remember, it was sold 1850 and marked as a burial ground. So after almost 40 years, there still is no marking. That's a trend that's going to continue. And Joe, thank you, bottom right, there's another cemetery here. Again, these are marked cemetery. They are not African-American, black cemeteries. Cedar View right here, no marking. Now here's the first aerial view of the area. I could look at maps all day. That really makes me a nerd, I think. Um, here again, Hurley's Lane. It's an actual road now. Here's our cemetery. These were added in, I believe, by Joe Gravis. You'll see a tree line marking the back. Behind the cemetery area back in here, now, years later, will be a, a um, neighborhood, not here at this point. All we have maybe is the tree line to help mark us. And then if we move to the 1956 aerial view, now for any you know church history people, St. Leo's, um, St. Leo the Great Parish, did not come into being until two years later, 1958. So there is no St. Leo's at this point. We have, again, Hurley's Lane. And we have what is now heavily wooded Cedar View Cemetery. Finally, 2013 view of the area. This is approximately, this is my circle driven, uh, drawn here. This is approximately where the cemetery is, and there's no way you would know from the air, nor the ground at this point, that there is a cemetery deep here of two acres in size. So when we, and I'm going to show you some pictures of what it looked like when we started to clean the cemetery, there was attention given to the Cedarview Cemetery in 1979 when Judy Norris 
attempted to document the gravestones. Again, in the late 1980s, 1988, 1989, Mae Edwards was present and exploring her family heritage based in the cemetery. And again, in 1990, there was a Boy Scout who made his Eagle Project on making some improvement to the cemetery. Um, however, until we started coming in in 2015, there wasn't a lot of neglect. I will say as a little bit of a joke, uh, in our cleaning, there were evidence of many a party that had occurred back in the woods, I guess, by maybe teenagers way back there um, trying to be out of sight. And I'm sure they were out of sight. So we have um, many interesting artifacts from some party things. Um, but the first things that we did try to do is get some picture of what we were looking at as far as the gravestones. And there are 53. We believe that there are a hundred or more people buried in Cedar View Cemetery. They don't necessarily have stones to mark, um, but we believe given the size of the plots and the size of the land, that there are probably well more people buried than these 53. And you'll notice that 13 of the folks have stars. Those are uh, designating Civil War veterans. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity to go and look at those headstones, you'll notice that's the U.S. Colored Troop Divisions. That's what's noted on the headstones. And these 13 men are uh, designated within the cemetery. There are also five stones that we just cannot seem to identify at this point. But this is uh, a labor of love and we will get there. Uh, but there are five more that are just not listed here. So just to look at, and I'm gonna connect this later, um, Charles and Hannah Reeves. Uh, Charles and Hannah Reeves are two member, two people uh, buried here in the cemetery. Charles Reeves, 1820 to 1900, and Hannah, 1829 to 1915. Their information and pictures were graciously offered by Amanda May Edwards um, to the students of Monmouth University, and I'll get to that in a bit as well. Um, but just to kind of give you some personalization to the cemetery at this point, we have Charles and Hannah. This is Charles's obituary in the Red Bank Register, dated September 5th, 1900. Um, this is, I, I love this part, these parts of the cemetery where it's really coming to life and we're getting names and pictures and faces. I, I will say as a person who's not by training a historian, I so believe mostly, you know, as a social worker in human rights and social justice and for me, the labor of the cemetery is really on making sure that the respect and the history is preserved. Um, so I, I love some of the artifacts that we've been able to gather and, and pull together um, as for the history of the cemetery. This is Charles and Hannah Reeves graves today. They're in the back of the cemetery. And you can see here, it was at a time that we were partially cleaned, I'll say, um, not at the point where we are now, but certainly you, the stones are very visible. You can read them. You can see other stones surrounding them. So I'm so happy that I took pictures in 2000. 15 when we, our group started to clean and I'll, I'll explain who our group is as well. Um, what did we walk into? We, we walked into a, a mess, um, an, an actual mess. Um, at the time, uh, November, 2015, we could not access the cemetery from Hurley's Lane 
as we can now. If you're driving up Hurley's Lane, it's very clear. You see the steps. At the time of our cleanup, which started November 2015, sorry, um, you could not access the cemetery through Hurley's Lane at all. St. Leo the Great Parish um, allowed volunteers who was doing cleaning to access the cemetery by climbing, climbing up their back field hill and climbing through these woods here that you see in front of you and into the cemetery. And you see one stone here that's just covered by brush and debris. Um, this is pretty much what the cemetery looked like when we came in in 2015. Some more pictures of that as well. Um, this is plot number two, the Holmes family. This is next to Silas Reeves. It's one of the very first plots that you can now see from Hurley's Lane. And you can see branches and uh, we put yellow tape to protect people from getting hurt. Um, all through the cemetery, you see something similar to this. Uh, lots of trees down, lots of, if you look really closely right here, you see a headstone, which is very much obscured by some fallen tree chunks uh, and lots of debris all around. There are several headstones toppled over. Um, a funny story I'll tell is, you know, the Boy Scouts were amongst the earliest volunteers. Uh, and when we were in those early days of trying to clear brush, one really exciting and heartening tale uh, happened quite a few times when one Boy Scout would find under some debris, a stone that looked like this, maybe toppled over, half buried, maybe not toppled over, but just completely buried. And that kid would just say, I found one. And then you would see shoom coming from all other areas of the cemetery, all the other kids trying to run to that kid to see what he had found. Another picture of the early days of the cleanup where you see a toppled over, two toppled over headstones. You see a lot of other stones very obscured um, by debris, by leaves, by everything. And of course, um, many people with much better cameras and photographing ability than I were able to come in and take very clear pictures of every single headstone and get them to us so that we could collect everything at one place. And so these are some extremely clear, way better than I could ever do, pictures of the headstones. This one down here you see was really buried. You can see how many inches of dirt and grass and debris were on top of that headstone. That headstone's totally cleared now. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about our plans um, because although we've been cleaning now for six years, there's so much more for us to get to. And so we have a group together now that's guiding what will hopefully be this permanent preservation plan. And we've applied for nonprofit status, but a lot of our thinking and our planning is around, of course, accessing and cleaning up and continuing to have cleaned the cemetery, locating each site, making it accessible, preserving the stones, photographing each site, transcribing the data on those markers. Some are very, very clear and it's easy to do and some are very difficult. Uh, compiling a database of the burials has been has begun as well, identifying the current owner of each plot. As I said before, one thing that's unusual for this cemetery is that each plot was individually deeded. It's not as if, you know, so-and-so church purchased all the land for their parishioners to be buried. Uh, that is not the case here. And so we are trying to identify the current owner of each plot 
marking the property corners. Um, the genealogical research, um, research all persons related to the cemetery, including John Crawford and the purchasers um, to see what, what can be gleaned, what can we know, establishing genograms and family tree for each. We have one member, quite a few members of our group are um, excellent genealogists and share their expertise and their data, um, establishing connections to a church if that's applicable create a continued research on the personal histories, continuing to gain information, are there any other Civil War veterans buried, and creating narratives for the cemetery. And then there's the physical part, uh, installing an entrance, perhaps markers, perimeters, uh, how, what do we do for long-term maintenance? This cemetery dates back to 1850, we need to preserve it. We need to preserve it for the history and for the dignity and respect of those buried there. So there are so many groups and individuals. Uh, I, I would never get all of them. I'd need 52 slides to do that. Um, the Boy Scouts have been instrumental in the cleaning and the volunteering. There, we have had two Eagle Scout projects. One Eagle Scout built the stairs, the entrance to the cemetery, and another one built a board. And I have some pictures to show you of that as well, um, marking a map of where each stone is. The parishioners, the students of St. Leo the Great, Pilgrim Baptist, Calvary Baptist, we've had Knights of Columbus, we've had students of Monmouth University, Historical Society members, Landmarks Commission, genealogists, historians, uh, neighbors, friends. I call it all hands on deck because really the sheer amount of people that we have been privileged to spend time with and who have given lots of energy to the cemetery has been immense and overwhelming. Here's some pictures of Boy Scout Troop 110. It's the Lincroft Troop. If you look here, seven of these big dumpster things were filled. So in between November of 2015 and March of 2016, seven of these big dumpster things were filled and carted away. Um, here's just some fraternity brothers who were in the, the cemetery, members of Pilgrim Baptist Church. This is the November 7th, 2015 cleanup. Here's our Eagle Scout projects. These are the stairs that now can be accessed um, by Hurley's Lane coming into the cemetery. And then the cemetery map. Now at this point, there were only um, 53 still stones, but not as much information as we have now. This Eagle project was from 2018. So part of respecting and connecting to the community has been tributes. We recently had just this past Memorial Day, uh, a tribute to Civil War veterans. We had the first one in November 8th of 2015, where we were able to have Civil War reenactors come and do a small ceremony of respect. And you'll see that there. And some of our volunteers, along with the reenactors. So, let me talk to you a little bit. You, you might ask, and I kind of inferred this before, why am I listening to a social worker talk about history? Where, where is the vent? So as social workers, we are taught um, human rights. That is one of the tenets of the social work profession. Um, we are taught community partnership. It's what our work is part of what distinguishes us from some of the other helping professions and disciplines. And so, my bent, my personal, one of my personal perspectives in my work in the cemetery has been connecting my students with the community and the cemetery and connecting the community into the Mammoth 
student body. And so we've done this in a couple of different ways. Bringing students into the Cedar View community has been a couple of different areas. Some has been physical. The big event is a university-wide day of service. It's been unfortunately canceled the last few years because of the pandemic, but so we are, any community group is, in, is able to sign up to be a recipient of service for the big event, that day of service. And so we signed up the Cedar View Cemetery and we were very lucky to get all of these students, we had 110 students in 2016. We had 75 students in 2017, and they spent the whole day physical laboring within the cemetery. And I joked that, you know, the fraternity brothers were trying to impress the sorority sisters. And so there was a lot of heavy lifting going on, but a tremendous amount of work was done by these two groups. And so that has been one way to connect the student body with, and these are not only social work students, these are university-wide different discipline students, undergrad as well as graduate. In addition to the physical nature of connecting the communities has been just authentic collaboration towards mutual goals the research piece, the genealogy piece. Uh, if you look right here, the small woman sitting is Amanda May Edwards. Many of you who have been in, in the community for a while may know her as a genealogist, historian. Uh, she was a wonderful, a, a wonderful woman and a sad loss. Uh, and I think myself and my students were privileged to have her do some narratives and to do some research and taping. And she shared so much of her research um, with the students of Monmouth University and therefore the larger community. And so here she is again. The flip side is bringing the expertise of the community into the classroom. And so back again in that first cleanup year, November 20th of 2015, we were privileged to have a lecture from Amanda May Edwards, a former African-American Genealogical Society president and descendant. And she shared not only her method of research, but some of her hard data on ancestors that were within the Cedar View community. And she just, when I tell you the students were hanging on her every word because the sharpness and the information that she brought to them, that level of respect was so apparent in the room. We were very lucky to partake uh, in her research and her time. So we're getting there in preserving the cemetery. You can see here, looks a lot different than it did uh, in those first couple of pictures I showed you. Um, here's a current picture uh, yesterday or the day before of the cemetery. And here is our last cleanup. There's Edwin. Um, if you look, it's very clear, the stones. There's one there. There's one back here. There's one in front. This is a view from Hurley's Lane into the cemetery itself. Um, and so we're getting there. Our plan is to continue to clean, to follow our preservation plan, um, to invite as many people to volunteer, whether it be hard labor and physical work or genealogy or just support uh, as we endeavor to preserve this cemetery permanently so that in 20 years from now, we aren't talking about how in 2015, there was a major cleanup that again slid back and we weren't able to preserve this important piece of history. Now, I do want to take a few minutes and turn it over to um, Edwin. Are you there, Edwin? 
I only see four people. So up oh, here he is. So I'd like to turn it over to Edwin to speak. You know my perspective from an academic and a social work side. Let's hear a little bit of the familial side, the ancestor side. Edwin, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I just uh, okay. was getting to a space where uh, there was no noise interruption. Uh, and we can hear you too, and I'm gonna go on mute. Okay. So you can take it away. All right, well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Joelle. Uh, so far, uh, you've been doing an excellent job. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with everybody tonight. Um, I would have to say, you know, um, the, the personal connection that's there obviously is a, a, a blood connection, is a ancestral connection. Uh, but at the same time, um, there's um, my mother, you know, um, she's been passed away for a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, she's a, a large, uh, there's a large uh, vacancy in my heart from her. And um, just knowing how hard she worked as a mother and the things that she did. And she found a lot of time, well, she found time and made time to, to do this research and to ca connect our family and to, to um, teach people in the community about genealogy. So uh, when I was in middle school, maybe about eighth grade or sixth, sixth to seventh grade, you know, she our grandmother lived in Luffman Towers, which is across the street from where this, uh, where the cemetery is. And one day, um, my mother was telling me about the cemetery. And she said, "Come on, let's go into the woods." And you know, I was uh, a little naive to going into the woods. I mean, we'd go into the woods and play, but I wasn't sure what we were going to find. And um, she showed me all these gravestones and obviously as you see from the pictures now we've really cleared out but now in 88 it was woods like thick woods so she was pointing things out to me and it was uh you know it was amazing to me that you know there were graves uh, buried in this in the wooded area and not only that um, they were related to me you know um, so I was like wow you know what what can we do so we started you know, trying to clear out little by little, we would make our visits. We might have a member of our church uh, or one of our friends come with us and we were doing this clearing out, clearing out. And, and my mother really wanted to have this uh, graveyard known and have it get the respect that it deserves and also um, uplift the, the names of the people that were there, let people know about their stories and let people know about the things that they have done in the community or, or their place in history. So, um, you know, as time went on, you know, momentum started building and little more got cleared out, a little more got cleared out. And, you know, I, as I moved on and went away to college and things that nature and became a little more busy, I wasn't there as much with my mother, but she would tell me and call me and tell me, oh, I'm meeting with Monmouth University. And she, she was telling me about her meetings with Joelle and, and the different people that were participating in the cleanup. So even though I wasn't there physically at that moment, I was there in spirit and I, I knew what was going on. And uh, fast forward all the way to now, you know, uh, it means even that much more to me to be out there to, to be working uh, because I know that, um, you know, my mother's looking down and she's happy and she's proud of the work that we're doing and the little work that she started in the beginning you know, has, has bloomed and blossomed into a, a group where we're trying to, uh, you know, do all the things that she wanted to do uh, with the cemetery. And we're, we're just trying to protect, you know, the cemetery and to, to make it uh, a safe and, and beautiful place and, you know, and let the, the names and the, the spirits that are there be truly in peace. Um, so it, it, it's, it's great. Uh, even in the last picture you saw, I was in there. My son is out there, and I've tried to explain to him the importance of him being out there. And uh, you know that it moves me even more because I know, you know, my mother would be even more excited and proud that he's out there. And hopefully, you know, he'll understand the importance of this place and down the road be able to bring his children here and say, you know, I was out here working and and, and helping to 
maintain this place and to to bring you know some some positivity and and to bring enlightenment to this area you know so um it, it, it's just I, I feel you know um i just feel really good about it and, and feel really good to be involved with the whole process and I'm, I'm thankful for those people that participate for the different troops that have come out the different volunteers that have come out and uh, you know that sometimes i think people don't really understand the importance of their work and you know they come out and they're doing a service for the community and they're joining with some people that are out there and they feel good but like you know if they knew how it all started and they really understood that you know these people that are buried there you know didn't have the opportunities and the options that uh you know others have had so um it, it it's really special. It's really special in that, in that sense. Thanks, Edwin. Thank you. So I see a couple of questions in the chat and I'll try to address them or Edwin, you jump into. Um, if is there a place to volunteer? I left my email um, in the chat. If anyone is interested, um, whether it be you wield a mean rake and you can come into the cemetery and help us rake or historical analysis or fundraising, we welcome all help. And so please email me if you're interested in actually participating in the cleanups. We'll have quite a few, two in September and two in October scheduled on the weekends. Uh, we do have lots of rakes and lots of tools and lots of gloves. So just wear protective clothing and protective shoe wear. Um, and we would love to have you help. Um, so that is one question. Uh, another question, is there continuing family in the area? We have been privileged to connect with at least five families um, that have, in addition to Edwin's family, that have um, folks buried in the cemetery. And we are um, always looking for more uh, and looking for the creation of those family trees. Um, and that's been a really exciting um, piece of all this. Um, as far as artifacts, yes, there were some beer cans and so forth, but we also found um, some evidence of the old stands where you might mount some flowers during a ceremony. Um, many, many footstones, um, which, you know, in present day, more modern cemeteries, you don't find um, footstones. So we found um, some artifacts that we've held on to um, when, when we were able to locate them. Let me see. Oh, the, the program on Memorial Day um, was um, a wonderful ceremony. I was really upset that I missed it this year. Um, but those are the type of things when we talk about connecting the community to the ceremony, to the cemetery, this is the important part of having um, commemorative events of We've been lucky now twice to get um, the reenactors come. Those are the pieces where we have to connect the history um, to the community. And so those have been a continuing effort and we will have more of those events and hopefully they'll get bigger and bigger each time. Do we have info on Crawford and his ties to slavery? We do know that um, he did own some slaves. Um, we don't have much more than that. Um, we are continuing and that's the part of research piece. So the students of Monmouth University in the master's program um, Edwin, I see your message and I will try to fix your unmuting. Um, let's see, did that work, Edwin? So part of the student body of the master's in social work, we've had those students doing continued research on the families, the ties to the ceremony, to the cemetery and what was happening in our part of New Jersey during that time frame. 
Go ahead, Edwin. Oh, I was just going to add for the Memorial Day event, there are pictures uh, and some videos on the Friends of Cedar View uh, site on Facebook. Um, there are a few more videos that are going to be added up, uh, not added, they're going to be posted on the site as well. Um, so uh, anyone who missed that event, you know, um, just look, check the page out, Friends of Cedar View, and um, look at some of the previous uh, pictures and videos. So I was going to type this, but um, one question that's in the chat is, um, do the families of the original plot buyers still own the plots? Um, they, the plots, because they were deeded to those folks, did then hand down to their descendants. And there's another, John Crawford and his family um, are, that's true. Um, John Crawford and his family are in the Black Birth Book, um, which is something that I wish I had a little snippet of Amanda May Edwards' talk, her video, um, from her talk to our students because, gosh, it was so rich in information. Okay, hold on. Do we have any plans on how to locate others buried there, ground penetrating radar? That has been discussed. Um, we have to raise some funds and this is where our nonprofit status comes into being. We have to raise some funds to be able to do ground penetrating um, sonar. However, what I'm understanding, and this is certainly not my area of expertise, ground penetrating anything, but my understanding is that the ground penetrating sonar actually just picks up anomalies in what is under the ground and doesn't necessarily discern it from any type of anomaly versus say human remains. And so that's one drawback, but it is something that our group is in constant discussion with um, and it costs some money. So that would be where the fundraising comes in. All right, Janelle, Edwin, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any comments or questions? Janelle or Edwin, maybe uh, either of you would like to give out the Cedar View Facebook page. Do you have Do you have a specific URL for that, or should, can they just search it on Facebook? You can search it right on Facebook. It's Friends of Cedar View. Okay, great. Okay, do we see any other questions coming in? Let me take a last look. I don't see anything else. Janelle or Edwin, anything else you would like to uh, talk about? Uh, no, please utilize my email. Um, I'm happy to meet new people and, and welcome them into our work at the cemetery. There's a group of about nine um, board members of Friends of the Cedar View and the more the merrier. This is a large project and it's gonna take a lot of time and we welcome more. All right, thanks. thank you so much, Joelle. And thank you so much, Edwin, too, for participating. Uh, and uh, thank you for everybody for attending tonight. We hope you've enjoyed it. We will be posting this to our YouTube channel in the coming days. So if you'd like to see uh, to watch it again, please visit us there. And if you want more info on the Historical Society or our upcoming speaker series, you can go to MiddletownNJHistory.org. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks Thank you. Thank you.